what you actually see is that every unique environment around the planet has a different leaf type that's specially designed for that climate, for that environment. And so what I just showed you is kind of like a typical canonical leaf, but if you look in all these different environments, I've just shown a few on the screen, you'll actually see that there's a different type of leaf design for each environment. So let me just give you an example. Conifers, pine trees, um, any kind of needle um, tree has several adaptations or designs that allow it to survive in, for example, the tundra, a very harsh environment for, for the typical leaf. For example, these trees actually produce antifreeze proteins that lower the melting temperature of, of water to allow them to survive in these environments. They have a, a rounded um, leaf that allows snow and ice to slide off more easily. Um, it has a waxy cuticle all the way around the leaf, so not just on the top surface, but all the way around the needle to protect it from that freeze-thaw cycle. And you could go on and on and on. And then you compare with something like an arid environment where you have pineapples, for example. Pineapples are a cam plant. They have specialized um, organelles in their um, cells that allow the plant to open up their pores only at night to take in as much carbon dioxide as they can, to use that carbon dioxide to um, store carbon, and then during the day they close their stomata so that they don't lose any um, oxygen to the heat of the day, and then they slowly work through that carbon dioxide reserve to power photosynthesis um, during the day. So no matter where you go on planet Earth, no matter what the environment, the climate, you will find a specialized design um, in plant leaves. And so one, one verse that comes to mind for me is in, in the Hebrew scriptures in Genesis 1, it says that each plant was created according to its kind, and it produced seeds according to its kind. So the challenge when you're studying plants is not to say, how did plants come about? How did we end up with leaves? That would, that would be too easy. The question is, how did you end up with every single one of these? Each of these designs specialized for their environment. Another dimension to the, the d design of leaves that's incredible is the fact that they're constantly sensing their environment. So if we go to back to that slide where it's showing the, the sensitive plant, um, you can see in this little animation that um, this particular plant, when you touch the leaves, when it feels the pressure of an herbivore um, reaching into its branches, it will quickly close its leaves, similar to what I was saying with the solar panel being able to fold up its panels. It will close its leaves to create the illusion that there's really nothing, nothing to see here, nothing to munch on, and the, the herbivore will then move along to a, a juicier looking plant. And you see this throughout the plant world, that, there is, um, that leaves are able to sense what's going on in their environment. Another example that some of you may be familiar with is the prayer plant. It's a common household plant. And there have been several studies recently that showed that the movement called nictinisty, the movement of prayer plant leaves throughout the day and night, accomplishes several functions for the plant. For example, shedding rainwater that is collected during the, in the rainforest during the day, shedding the rainwater at night so that the leaves can turn upright during the day and continue photosynthesizing. And one of my favorite examples comes from a study that I did um, of quaking aspen. It's a, a very important tree. It's um, a food source for Rocky Mountain elk, and it's a um, clonal species, which means that it spreads through, propagates through the roots, and so you can have an entire stand of quaking aspen the size of this room or larger that's um, genetically identical. It's basically a single organism connected through the roots. And one of the things we studied um, was the way that quaking aspen can respond to the environment by sensing whether it was being eaten by insects, whether it was being eaten by something like a, an herbivore, a deer, an elk, or whether it was an environment that was free of, um, largely free of herbivores. And it would have a different response. So for example, if insects were feeding on the leaves, it would start producing new leaves that had a high tannin content a chemical compound that would turn away the insects, basically. It's impalatable to the insects. And so that would be its response to insect herbivory. If, on the other hand, the plant decided that, or could sense that it was being fed on by something like a deer, well, there's no good in producing more tannin. The deer will just chew right through that. What the plant instead will do, it'll shoot up a new leader. So if we're talking about the young, um, young trees, it'll shoot up a new leader until it gets about six, seven feet tall, just above the browse height of a deer, 
and then it will branch out and start producing new leaves. So it can sense the, the danger and start producing leaves at a, at a safe height. And then in an environment where you have neither of those things going on, it will follow kind of a normal growth pattern and um, really flourish in that environment. So it's a, amazing that the leaf is doing a lot of what the solar panel is doing, but so much more, right? It's also sensing and responding to its environment. And then just a few more examples here. When I say leaves are solar panels, but also so much more, think about what else the leaf is accomplishing. So let me give you a few examples. Leaves often take on a particular shape. Sometimes we mistake them for flowers because they're very ornate leaves. And um, one example is the bee orchid that actually mimics the, the female bee so that a male bee will come to the flower and pollinate and um, spread from flower to flower and help it propagate. Another example is transpiration. The leaf is actually taking, as it's taking in oxygen from the environment, it's also evaporating water. And what that allows the plant to do through capillary action is actually to pull water all the way from the ground, through the roots, up the tree. It could be a 300-foot tall tree, and it will passively pull water from the ground using this process of transpiration, and that's all happening because of the design of the leaf, because of how it's designed for gas exchange. And I could go on and on with all these incredible examples. Um, if we have time in the Q&A, ask me about disguise and plants that have been discovered that can actually disguise themselves as other plants, an incredible feat that we still don't quite understand. And then, of course, the plant is doing so much more even for the environment. It's capturing carbon out of the atmosphere, which is very important for maintaining the climate. It's producing tons of food material. It's um, regenerating the soil. It's producing shade for larger organisms. And then the incredible thing, the, the coup de grace, so to speak, of this technology that we find in leaves is that if you compare it to human technology, it's like the, the holy grail of sustainable technology because it's renewable. It's using basically infinite solar power to run all this technology. It's recyclable meaning all of the material that it produces in these leaves can also be pulled back into the plant and reused in the production of new leaves through a process of senescence. And it's what we call zero residue. Basically, it means there's no waste. Any of the, the plant material that falls to the ground, leaves, limbs, etc., all of that very quickly becomes part of the soil and part of the ecosystem. And so, again, it's amazing when you compare a leaf to something like a solar panel, it's amazing to see that it's accomplishing a lot of the same things, but also so much more, well beyond anything we could imagine. It's like me trying to sell you a solar panel, and then at the end of my sales pitch saying, oh, I forgot to mention, this solar panel is also a whole house air conditioning unit and a missile defense unit and a, you know, all sorts of other things, right? Like, what an incredible thing that this one technology can accomplish so many things.